Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, the Velociraptor. It's nothing like the movies. And Penn Gillette on how to wrap your head around big numbers. So, oh, we should start at the beginning, shouldn't we? And say hello. Hello. And welcome yeah. back. It's... Series two, we made it. Yes, we, we have been successful enough that we can be bothered to have another go. And we've got quite a few exciting guests coming up this series as well. So look forward to those, including a man who doesn't like Jurassic Park. And yeah. uh, hated Jurassic Park, loathed it. Did um, you? I, I, just that usual empty popcorn jive. I didn't think it had, you know, it, then you have Spielberg's crazy thing of, well, you know, it'll inspire more paleontologists. Listen, Steve, we already have too many paleontologists. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd agree and, with that. <laughs> and it's not a career to go into. That's not where you want. Why didn't it teach people to want to be plumbers? That would be useful. Um <laughs> I thought the special effects were lousy. Right. Didn't think it looked good. Didn't give me the proper sense of wonder what dinosaurs are think about dinosaurs the joy of it to me for it to expand our view of ourselves in the universe and in time and jurassic park strove to do the exact opposite yeah. it strove to take dinosaurs and make them smaller make them just um characters in in, in a drama that took place in months Whereas dinosaurs, to me, are supposed to move our drama to 200 million years, you know, yeah. exp expand it out. Um, it was like, you know, taking, uh, taking the idea of the universe and bringing it down to human terms. I don't want to see dinosaurs on human terms. I want to see humans on dinosaur terms. I think that's yeah. more profound, more poetic, um, richer, deeper. And uh, so I didn't like it. And that was, of course, Penn Gillette, who we're very fortunate to have on the podcast. More of his interview coming later. But he does introduce a really interesting theme, which is that missizing of dinosaurs. And Jurassic Park is incredibly guilty of this because, I mean, when we think of velociraptors, we think of the velociraptors from Jurassic Park. And velociraptors were nothing... Well, they weren't even famous before Jurassic Park, were they? No, I, th I think most people had never heard of them. The, the average dino nerd probably did know what they were and had, had heard of them. And, that, you know, we had enough good specimens that they would turn up in books and at the time were a kind of fairly charismatic, exemplar, small dinosaur. But that was about it. And they were nowhere near that classic list of T-Rex, Triceratops, Diplodocus, Stegosaurus, Brontosaurus. People start to run out at that point. You know, it, it wasn't even close. And Velociraptor, the, the book initially, and then the film, obviously completely transformed that to the point that multiple generations, really, actually, at this point, he said, feeling really old when he says multiple generations. Uh, <laughs> T-Rex, Velociraptor, it's kind of the second name on the list of dinosaurs people have heard of and can name and have a pretty good idea in their mind's eye what it looks like because they've seen it in all the films. And yeah, it didn't really look like that. No, because that, I mean... When you look at a Allosaurus, it looks more like an Allosaurus, the ones that we think of Velociraptors-ish, without the toes. Yeah, so the, there's lots of things to get in there. I mean, the first thing to say, because one day I want to talk about kind of dinosaur art and representations of dinosaurs, and putting stuff in the context of time. So at the time of Jurassic Park, the book and the first film, the d dinosaurs being the origin of birds was increasingly becoming very certain. Velociraptor was very much part of that discussion because it was a relatively small, lightly built animal from a group that we were understood to be very close to the origin of birds. And I think most people probably thought it likely had feathers at that point, but we still didn't actually know. And there remained at least the possibility that feathers really did spring up when birds did. And it was a something coincident with flight. And so making them scaly back then was not the travesty that a lot of people make it out to be. They're like, oh, well, they should be fully feathered, and they got that completely wrong. I think most people knew or would have said, the odds are it was feathered. It's so close to the origin of birds, it's unlikely that feathers just appeared magically at the you know, very short period of evolution period. Likely lots of these other animals had them too. Velociraptor would have been a prime candidate for that. 
but it's very difficult to make them look scary if they're floofy. Yeah, and there's there's that audience expectation thing. I mean, there's there's a there's a bit in the book which I was always slightly surprised didn't make it into the film where they discuss basically culling the dinosaurs in the park and re-engineering them to be like what people expected them to be because they thought that mm. would be better. And Velociraptors, I think, are somewhat in that, in, in terms of how they did appear in the film, are somewhat guilty of that in that it will look weird if we put feathers on them and we don't have time to explain that the modern science thinks they're probably feathered and the bird, and, and so they just didn't do it. Yeah, we, we have known for a considerable period of time now that Velociraptor would have been fully feathered, pretty much head to toe, um, with big long feathers on the arms in particular, and would have looked a lot more like a bird with teeth and a long tail than any other kind of scaly representation that you have seen in many, many cinematic adventures and tie-in <laughs> books. Video games, <laughs> posters and associated merchandise. And my garden. And your um, garden, yeah. <laughs> indeed. But what about, um, but their size? I mean, their size is totally out. And and that's the other one. And that, that one gets tangled up as well. So there's, um, again, around the time that Crichton was working and writing his book, there was a famous book came out called Predatory Dinosaurs of the World by a guy called Greg Paul, who is mostly an artist, though he has some formal training in paleontology and has bunch, published a bunch of scientific papers as well. Um, and in this book, one of the things he did is he did a whole bunch of reclassifications. And he said that Velociraptor uh, was the same genus, so two, two species in the same genus, was the same thing as a thing called Deinonychus from North America. And so he said Velociraptor was named first, so the ruling is that keeps the name, and Deinonychus, we say, is sunk into Velociraptor. And in the Jurassic Park book, this is quite explicit. So, so Grant, the paleontologist, talks about the difference between Velociraptor mongoliensis, which is the one obviously from Mongolia, and Velociraptor antiropus, which is Deinonychus, Deinonychus antiropus. The, the, the interpretation everyone has in the book is that, and in the film, is that it is Deinonychus, which was a lot bigger than Velociraptor, and they've just misnamed it. However, in the book, Crichton specifically says that the DNA for the ones in the park was Mongoliensis, which is the little one. So even though the origins of Velociraptor maybe being much bigger than it should be lies in that synonymy by Greg Paul, Crichton still deliberately picked the little one and then made it six foot tall. And even Deinonychus isn't six foot tall, so... Well, it's not quite six foot tall. I mean, when it stretches right up, it is. Well, when, when they kind of stand up, they're, all, they're, they're almost eye level with the human, so very close to... Yeah, but to... Those, those are actors. You have to remember, Hollywood well, actors are tiny. <laughs> yes. So I reckon they're about five foot, maybe, with, and if they stretch up a bit, they're six foot. Right, but it's... <laughs> Way, way, way too big. Even if it was Dionychus, it should be a lot smaller. So Dionon Dionychus, Dionychus, sorry, she's just trying to say this. Dionychus. It does sound like a Roman. <laughs> Has that got all the, you know, like the claws of Velociraptor? Does it look like Velociraptor, just bigger? Yeah, so Deinonychus and Velociraptor are close relatives, and there's a bunch of others. Microraptor we've mentioned before, Utahraptor, which is a really big one and is human plus sized. Um, there's a load of them out there, and yeah, they do have the characteristic body shape that we would associate with that Velociraptor. They have a relatively small head, none of these giant T Rex things, um, a nice S shaped, relatively long neck. Uh, a long and fairly stiff tail. Long arms. So most carnivorous dinosaurs have really quite short arms. And obviously everyone takes the mick out of T-Rex's tiny arms. But even things like Allosaurus, which are much more, in inverted commas, kind of mainstream or normal, their arms are quite large. But, you know, they, they kind of barely reach to the back of their jaw if they stretched up. Velociraptor's arms would reach out in front of its head if it stretched them forward. They, they have very long arms indeed. And relatively long legs. And in particular, yeah, the famous raptorial claw, so the giant second toe, which is held cocked off the ground and sits kind of Ready free to up. Pierce. Yeah, basically. Um, and so that that body shape really is. This is a group called dromaeosaurs. That is the dromaeosaur body shape. So we would be kind of fine with the films if they said these are Utah raptors that have been plucked. <laughs> If, the, if you said that, you're, you're a lot closer to, to what they were probably like. Um, yeah, I, and I, I think at least in part, 
Um, Crichton used Velociraptor because he liked the name. It means fast hunter or fast killer. He's able to abbreviate that to raptors, which sounds good. There's a plot point in the book that the word raptor gets out and people know there's this thing that I call a raptor going around, but they don't know what it means. And of course, that doesn't really work for Deinonychus. <laughs> a Roman soldier is coming! Run! Yes, yeah, so, or, you know, you, it doesn't abbreviate nicely. It doesn't have a particularly sexy... Well, that's, that's terrible claw, but it's, yeah. it's not quite as good in terms of how he wanted to use it. Talking of the terrible claw and stuff, I mean, in the films that is used for great effect, because the whole idea is that these are pack animals and they're actually even at one point capturing somebody and torturing them with the claw to get them to cry out and bring the others close. You know, so they're, they're seen in the films, they're represented as very, very clever pack animals. They talk to each other with calls, yeah. they're super fast. How yeah. much of this behaviour is in any way real? Very little. Oh. <laughs> um, as, so as, as usual, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, some paleontological literature speculates that certain things are possible and then that gets run rampant with beyond all reasonable expectation when it comes to fiction. And often a lot of that stuff in the first case wasn't particularly solid. Um, so we'll start with the speed because that's an easy one. There's that line in the first film. Oh, but if they ever got into the open, they'd hit 50 or 60 miles an hour. No chance. Um, they, <laughs> even for even allowing for their miniature size, they're just not that quick. Very, very few animals on land are even remotely that fast. Um, cheetahs. Yeah, cheetahs, ostrich are very quick. Pronghorn are very quick, but... Um, pronghorn? Pronghorn, uh, North American antelope that's not quite okay. an antelope. Pronghorn literally because they have a little pair of horns that point backwards and there's a little arrow nudge that sticks forward, which is the prong. Um, okay. They're very, very quick. Uh, but... Yeah, velociraptors are never going to reach that top speed. Estimating dinosaur speed is horrible. Velociraptors were probably pretty quick. I wouldn't want to be in a race against one. I'm sure I'd lose. I'm sure people much faster than me would lose. There is a huge jump from that to 50 miles an hour. Um, well below that, I, I'm, I'm really quite confident. So we, we can tick that one off. Um, pack hunting. Oh, God, I would love to do a podcast on pack hunting at some point. Um... <laughs> <laughs> the short answer for pack hunting in basically everything is no, or at least we've got no good evidence for it. So the evidence we always have for group hunting, or at least groups in predatory dinosaurs or carnivorous dinosaurs, is always, oh, well, we found a site with multiple animals dead together, or we found, in the case of Deinonychus specifically, actually, there's these several sites with a herbivorous dinosaur called Tenontosaurus and evidence of lots of Deinonychus feeding there because we find loads of broken teeth. And in one case, actually, a couple of Deinonychus skeletons. Well, that doesn't mean that they hunted it together and that doesn't mean that they lived together. Is that an old tar pit or anything like that? In, in those cases, no specifically. But yes, there is a phenomenon called predator traps where an animal gets trapped, it dies, all the predators come along because that's free food, so they get trapped, and then there's more bodies dying on the surface, so more predators come, and you can accumulate predators very quickly. La Brea tar pits are exactly that case. There's like three or four times as many wolves and lions as there are bison, and that and deer, and that's not <laughs> how ecology works ever. Um, so it tells you something weird is going on. Um, but even so, you know, you've got things like spotted hyenas, which, you know, they love showing in documentaries, uh, you know, chasing antelope in big groups and fighting off lions in big groups. They're really weird, though, hyenas. They're, they're like, all the girls are, all the girls, they have they have false penises. Yes. And, oh, look, it's a matriarchy, and they're weird. Uh, it's not quite a matriarchy. It's a bit more oh. complicated than that. And this is only the spotted hyenas. The other hyenas don't do that. But anyway, the, the central point being that there's this idea that Spotted hyenas are these great pack hunters. And while they will hunt together, they mostly hunt alone. So even if you find evidence of lots of predatory dinosaurs living together or having died together, A, that doesn't necessarily mean they live together, and B, if they did live together, it doesn't necessarily mean they hunt in groups. I am absolutely convinced that lots of them did, but the evidence we have, particularly when people then spread it more widely, is extraordinarily weak. So just because, let's assume Deinonychus did hunt in packs, big social structures, matriarchy, patriarchy, hierarchical systems, alphas, betas, all the rest of it, that really has no bearing on Velociraptor. 
in the same way that what lions do doesn't tell you anything about what tigers or leopards do. They do all like cardboard boxes. Though. Well, they do that. But, you know, <laughs> but like, you know, the fact that hunting dogs and wolves hunting groups doesn't really, and dolls in India doesn't tell you about things like bush dogs, which are solitary, or maned wolves, which live in pairs. Or foxes. Or, or foxes, yeah. You, you cannot easily transpose these kind of big behaviours between even extremely closely related species. So tyrannosaurs were a huge bugbear for me. There is some pretty good evidence of groups in tyrannosaurs, but that has become T-Rex and all other tyrannosaurs hunted in packs. There is no reason to think that that's the case whatsoever. Um, one one would assume from an outside perspective that animals that hunt in packs require communications. So they might have a slightly bigger brain or this might be might have better sort of signalling systems or some sort of communication. I mean, in the films, for example, Velociraptor had very like elaborate they went into the voice box of it and how it had different calls. Is that any is there anything no, well, no way, evidence? I don't know. Highly structured social animals often do have more of their brain devoted to that kind of stuff. I don't think that necessarily correlates with a particularly larger brain. Uh, and yet lots of other things that are mostly solitary can communicate quite strongly. If, you know, if that's a really important part of their biology, such as, you know, finding a mate, there will be a lot of natural selection favouring those animals that communicate effectively. That doesn't necessarily mean they're automatically social or having complicated social interactions. And some things which are very social still don't communicate very much. Um, you know, uh, that's the other thing. There's big differences between aggregating groups, so things that just like hanging around with each other or, or just not bothered if they're hanging around with each other. I think crocodiles, it's, you tend to see just lots of crocodiles hanging around together, not because they actively want to be together, but because none is a particular threat or worry for each other. There's lots of fish in the pool. No one's getting into any fights. It doesn't matter. Um, and then you move from that into species that actively aggregate. If you left them on their own, they wouldn't be very happy and they'd want to be with others. Like us. We are well, right, and, right. And there's various versions of that from fairly loose aggregations where as long as you're in a group, you're not too worried because it's mostly about mutual protection or defence or finding food, like, say, starlings when they come together across to highly social species yeah like us or meerkats or things like that where there's lots of interactions and social structures and communications and bloody bloody blah and then all the way through into eusocial animals famously things like bees and ants where there's these really complicated that they're so integrated they're almost one organism yeah basically but we have those in mammals too because we have things like mole rats or at least the naked mole rats. So they are you social organisms. So, you know, kind of like hyper social in that context. And this is, this is something I've written about in a couple of papers. There's this horrible problem when it comes to talking about dinosaurs, even in the scientific literature, where people sweep all of those different things under the banner social. And of course, it covers such a vast different array of behaviours that it's really awful to go, oh, we're tyrannosaur social. And it's like, uh, well, do you mean aggregates and what kind of aggregations or social or you social and what degree within that? Yeah, it's it's almost a meaningless question. So what about, let's get back to the voice box though. So in, in, in the film, they talk about the voice box. They even make a little like like horn of it and they blow through it to make noise of that. I take it, is that, that's not possible, is it? So in, in that case, yeah, they're, they're saying it's basically the palate and we do have several particularly well-preserved um, velociraptor skulls but it's missing all the soft tissue. Um, it's missing the stuff that would, the palate will obviously give you the basic shape, obviously the roof of the mouth and the sinuses and stuff, but it's way more complicated than that. Um, so no. Could they communicate? Almost certainly, because basically almost everything communicates, even if it's just a grunt or a growl or a wheeze or something. Yeah, I often think what it would be like if you're a cuttlefish and you're looking at everything else going, why aren't you communicating? I have all of my patterns. Why can't you just pulse the light in your skin, you weirdos? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and, it, you know, communication can be silent, you know, raise your wings or your, ta you know, dogs do loads of, you know, non non-vocal communication with body posture. There's lots of ways of communicating effectively in different ways, with, or having multiple different signals without having to go down the route of having a complicated voice box to make complicated different sounds. Okay. And then how clever were they is obviously the last bit of that kind of triumvirate. Well, fairly, yeah. Dromaeosaurs as a whole and that kind of very near bird dinosaurs have proportionally some of the largest brains of the dinosaurs. That makes them probably some of the smartest ones. 
But again, the film says, oh, chimpanzee level intelligence. Um, no, there's no reason to think they had anything like that. Chimps are extraordinarily smart, right up there with the other smartest animals that we know of, you know, in that kind of band just below us. There's no reason to think Velociraptor or the other dinosaurs, any of the other dinosaurs are getting anywhere near that kind of level. Smart, potentially, but I'd say dog smart at a push, which is a long way shy of what chimps are well, capable of. It, because they're related, wouldn't they be more sort of crow smart, that sort of level, where they could actually problem solve a little bit, but can't, you know, you know, lick well, your Well, I mean, I yeah, so, right, so who knows potentially? So, you know, there, there's mm. always that caveat of, well, we don't actually know. But, yeah, cr- crows and parrots are extraordinarily intelligent, um, but... They are rare. You know, very few birds have got anything like that level of problem-solving intelligence, and they are very smart, but again, they're still not close. I think most of the time, you know, there's a few individual animals, so there's Alex, who was a famous African grey parrot, um, so there's a few which obviously do better than others. I think as a whole, you would still put parrots and crows below things like chimps, um, probably below things like dolphins. Um, and there's no particular reason to think, you know, there's basically no particular reason to think that Velociraptor or any of the other dinosaurs were anything like as smart as those guys. But no, we obviously can't prove it. Um, so what was, so, okay, we know what the film kind of got wrong. Um, what do we know about their behaviour? Not that much. So Velociraptor is, in that regard, a really quite weird animal in that it's particularly famous, but we don't know a huge amount about it. So they were first discovered in the 1920s. So the famous um, East Asia expedition from the American Museum of Natural History out in Mongolia and China found first dinosaur eggs and lots of other things. And one of the things they found was Velociraptor. And so it was named in 1924, I think. Um, But it's not like there is some enormous research history on Velociraptor with voluminous papers describing all these specimens in great detail and covering lots of stuff about their biology. That that just doesn't exist in, in the way that T-Rex, you know, mountains and, you know, literally hundreds of papers just on T-Rex, not even discussing other things. Velociraptor, it's a handful, I think, to be quite honest. So it's very important. Well, it's much smaller. It's much it smaller. Is. It's less exciting. But for a start, you know, there's far fewer specimens of it, and most of those are in Mongolia. So, you know, T-Rex is in dozens of different museums, and there's casts everywhere. If you want to go and work on it, there's probably one quite near you velociraptor that's not the case and they're very fragile they're hard to work with um and they're few and far between and so there's that enormous volume of literature just doesn't exist very very quickly where were they located then because if all the fossils are in mongolia were they not in the states were they in europe do we know when they no so they're around about uh 71 75 million years ago so pretty close to the end of the dinosaurs and from this you know famous set of beds across much of southern Mongolia, uh, in particular a locality called the Flaming Cliffs because of how it looks in the sunset. It's supposed to be absolutely magical. I was supposed to go a couple of years ago and I had to cancel it and I'm very aggrieved because I really want to go to Mongolia in the Flaming Cliffs. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, huge profusion of fossils there. Um, and so Velociraptor is relatively common, though, again, it's it's a relatively large carnivore for its time, despite its size. Um, and so there just aren't that many of them. There's stuff that's come out in China. So the Chinese province of Inner Mongolia. Um, there is stuff that I've worked on and, and helped uncover and, and, and study, which could be Velociraptor, but we're not 100% sure that we haven't got enough good complete skeletons to definitively say it's either Velociraptor or a very close relative of that called Sargan, or a thing that we named from the Chinese side called Linharaptor. Now, at least some people think Linharaptor is the same thing as Sargan, um, which is quite possible. I'm, Despite being one of the people who helped name it, I'm rather on the fence about that, and I'm not too fussed either way. I have described Velociraptorine teeth from China, associated with protoceratops bones, so a little ceratopsian dinosaur, with bite marks on it. And of course, we've just got teeth, and we've got enough of those teeth to say they're Velociraptorine, but we can't tell apart Velociraptor from Linharaptor from Sargon from them. So maybe that's Velociraptor, but maybe they're not either. Okay, so we're basically talking about late on in the Cretaceous, and we're talking about really just in one area that we know of. Yeah. And and remind us again, because I don't think we actually went into the exact size of them. We sort of said they were smaller than, you know, human height. But how small are, are they coming up to you? Kind of waist height. So... 
Our waist tight or normal people's waist tight? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're about, about not a million miles off either. So an, an adult velociraptor is about two metres or so from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. And obviously they stand with the tail out straight and then the body slightly angled up and the neck slightly angled up and the head pointing down. So the top of the head would be, yeah, one metre twenty, one metre thirty off the ground. Basically like a large dining table, but slightly higher up. Yeah, it, you know, it would probably stretch up like a, like a dog. It would probably stretch up to put its nose on the kitchen counter. Um, Aww. So one, one thing I get asked all the time when I'm doing outreach stuff with kids is, would you win in a fight with Velociraptors? Because, of course, they've seen all the films of these huge things. And the answer is, I'd hope so. Because they weigh like <laughs> 20 kilos or so. And yeah, they've got some nasty <laughs> teeth and claws on them. But I weigh like five times that in my lockdown diet phase. And <laughs> I'd like to think that I could just kind of fall on it. And that would be yeah. the end of the fight. <laughs> I'd probably get scratched up quite badly. But I'd like to think that I'd win without it taking too long. <laughs> just avoid the, the, the pointy bits. Which, which to be fair, there's, there's, a, there's a lot. There's a lot of it. Um, so because they've go- got the arms as well. So what? Um, just very, you know, we were talking about their behaviours and stuff. Did they use the arms to climb, or were they just for attacking? Or- yeah. So th- there's a lot of stuff that's been said about the about the hands and the feet actually. Um, and so it's worth kind of talking about that as a as a kind of unit. So yeah, the the arms are relatively long. I mean, they're strong but not massively muscled. These aren't some sort of bodybuilder build super strong uh, muscles. Long fingers with relatively big curved claws on them. The hand claws in particular are nothing like as hooked as you see on things like predatory birds. This is worth having a brief um, rejoinder. The term raptor has now become a thing for velociraptor-like dinosaurs, even though there's a whole bunch of other things completely unrelated to it that have raptor as the suffix to their name, like oviraptors. Um, and so, ra- and of course, we use the word raptor to mean predatory birds like owls and eagles and falcons. And so the term raptor, when you're talking about things like velociraptor, is a pain in the ass because I just wanted <laughs> to talk about raptors, meaning birds, and I knew that everyone would immediately think I meant velociraptors and that terminology for dinosaurs must die stop using raptor to be fair everybody else who isn't a paleontologist when you say raptor everybody assumes you mean bird of prey so it's just you who talks about both you should see his face now guys he looks proper angry (laughs) only because I am Um, right so you know the hand claws are pretty sharp but they're not like these really puncture and cutting talons like you would see on them. So they might be used for catching something, but not for killing it. Yeah, so that's the next bit that we'll get to. And then in the feet, yeah, again, similar to the hands overall. And then the, the famous raptorial claws, a big curved one on the second toe, which I think is often reconstructed far, far shorter than it should be. Really? People, whenever they draw these or make models of them, almost universally just put kind of the keratinous sheath just over the top and they're done. And actually, if you look at well-preserved fossils of uh, Microraptor, where we've got complete claw sheaths and even Archaeopteryx and a whole bunch of other birds and even some of the larger dromaeosaurs uh, and even some pterosaurs, you can see that the sheath like doubles the length of the claw and completely changes the angle of it. And they're, they're almost a half moon shape. Um, sorry, almost a semicircle. Um, and that's not how people ever illustrate them and show them. So that claw is an even longer and even more curved. Um, and the other thing is okay. it's, it's inevitably yeah. described as being razor sharp which is very odd because they're really quite wide. Um, and that indicates something that's good at puncturing rather than something that is good at cutting. So it's doing a different job. And that would also make sense because, again, this, this toe is cocked to be kept off the floor, which keeps the tip sharp. This is exactly what cats do. Uh, and there's really quite a lot of musculature and tendons associated with that to allow it to sweep through an arc. But it is almost certainly far more about stabbing things than it is about slashing things, which is how it's always described. Because it's relatively fat and not really thin and narrow, which is what you'd want for a for a cutting claw. So, OK, it has got this big puncturing, presumably death-killing thing on the floor. It's got teeth as well, because you found loads of them, because they fall out. You've got, you got hands, claws, which aren't particularly deathly, but probably good for snatching things. What can we tell from its anatomy about its behaviour? What, what we think they're fundamentally doing, and this is where the analogy is good, is they're doing what a lot of large raptors, as in modern predatory birds, 
do. So things like buzzards do this, and this is a thing called mantling. And you will see this when they catch something like a big rabbit or um, a big bird, uh, and they basically stick their feet into it and, you know, squeeze their toes together. And in this case, that raptorial claw is going to do a really good job of stabbing into and gripping something. And then in the case of the birds, they will just bring their wings around and over. In the case of the velociraptors, they may well grab them with their hands as well. But velociraptors have their big, long wing feathers. We know they had them, just like uh, predatory birds do. And if you can imagine from the point of view of you're the animal that's trying to get away, you've been grabbed and quite possibly punctured, which is already a bad start for escaping. Not a good day. Now this kind of net of feathers comes down and around and encloses you. And it becomes even harder to get away. You're, you're basically trapped in this little pocket. And of course, any small thing like that is going to make it just that little bit harder to get away and therefore just that little bit longer that you're there scrabbling and being gripped and you might get another bite or another stab and that's basically the end of you. So do we think that's why? Because obviously they couldn't fly. This is why they developed these large feathers as a sort of trapping cloak. That's one suggestion. So as ever, everything usually has multiple functions. I mean, let's face it, feathers are sexy, so you know. Well, also that, but if you look at videos of ostriches running at high speed, ostriches have big wings despite not flying, and they will use these to help turn and break because they're good for that. You know, feathers are relatively lightweight, and yet you can basically use them as air brakes. There's no reason to think the velociraptor couldn't have done the same thing. They could easily have signaled with them, just like you mentioned earlier. Quite probable that those feathers are doing multiple different things simultaneously. And it's probable that the ancestors, or at least something very close to the ancestors of velociraptors, were at least gliding, and therefore they would have had really strong selection for flight feathers and big long primary feathers, which may have then held on to the lineage which branched off and produced velociraptor. In other words, it was already basically in its genetic armoury and it's re-expressing them. But the critical thing as well about all of this is what it really suggests they're doing is eating small stuff not going after, in a big pack, something 5, 10, 50 times their size. Uh, and we do at least have some evidence that supports this. Um, two papers, actually, that I've written. So one, which I already mentioned, we've got these velociraptorine teeth with a protoceratops and with bite marks on the bones. Now, protoceratops is a lot bigger than velociraptor, but in this case, we put together evidence that this was probably scavenging. So it didn't kill it. Um, it was just feeding on a dead one that it found. And another one that I worked on, which is... Definitely Velociraptor proper, and it's a specimen from Mongolia with a with a nice skull, and it's a complete rib cage. So there's actually more of it, but preserved. There's a single block of the rib cage, so all the backbone, all the ribs, all the sternal plate from the chest, and all the other little bones. And in the middle of all of this, right inside, is a big long wing bone from a pterosaur that it presumably swallowed whole, which wow. is quite an achievement. And again, there's a reason to think that 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 is scavenging. So they're probably not eating big things very often. And when they do, there's, it's probably because that was already dead. Though there's one extremely famous counterexample, which is a thing called the fighting dinosaurs specimen. Fighting dinosaur specimen is a mid-sized protoceratops. It's actually not a particularly big one. They get rather larger than this. And a velociraptor locked, and as the phrase always is, in mortal combat. And as far as we can tell... They genuinely died together and one or other killed one or other. The protoceratops is more or less standing upright, as it were, so it's in the pose that you would expect it to be in life. The velociraptor is kind of lying half on its side. The velociraptor has its arm trapped inside the mouth of the protoceratops. I haven't seen the original specimen, but I've seen an exceptionally well-made cast of it in a museum in Japan. So you can see the details beautifully. And yeah, the beak is basically closed around it. You would not be able to just pull that arm back out sideways or, or even out the front of the mouth. It, it's in there. And at the same time, the velociraptor's foot is up and that raptorial killing claw is stuck up to basically the base of the throat of the protoceratops. So maybe the velociraptor killed the protoceratops, but then couldn't escape and just lay there and eventually died. 
maybe the protoceratops crushed and fell on or stopped the velociraptor moving but then had so much blood loss it died they're buried in what we think is a collapsed sand dune so maybe the sand dune collapsed on them while they were both still alive it's what you get for fighting kids it's what you get for fighting it is but you have this one in a million one in a billion specimen of two animals of different species stuck together apparently having killed each other and of course that brings up the prospect that velociraptor was going after a much bigger protoceratops and was trying to eat it um and so that is the kind of classic counter example but if it was going in a pack then that protoceratops oh no unless because it was buried wasn't it so maybe the pack just saw all their mate just get yeah, you know. but but also you know okay it's what you know it's a one it's a one-off specimen and you've always got to be careful not over interpreting a single specimen when you've got half a dozen that always show the same pattern then it's clearly happening regularly but you know predatory animals rarely go after things that can fairly easily kill them um it is not normal for lions to go hunting rhino and elephant because it's a really bad idea yes you might bring it down most of the time you might even bring it down nine times out of ten but for a predatory lineage if one time in ten there's a good chance that you'll get injured or even killed those genes are not going to hang around in the gene pool very long. Um, and I would, so I, I would argue you could turn this on its head and say, the reason they didn't go after predators very often is they're perfectly capable of killing them. Uh, they are a lot bigger. And there are some. Badgers are a good example. Iberian lynx are a good example. It is rare for predatory dinosaurs, sorry, it's rare for predatory animals full stop, to go after prey that are much bigger than themselves. Um, and predis- even a mid-sized protoceratops is four or five times the weight of a velociraptor. Most predators yeah, they hunts- could have been like weasels, though. That's the thing. Weasels go after huge it, They could, in which case they should be much better at killing them without getting killed themselves. <laughs> It seems really, I don't know, fortuitous or slightly freaky that we've got... Because you said earlier we don't actually have that many specimens of Velociraptor, and yet one we do have is an action scene. Yeah, it's... (laughs) uh, I mean, I I guess it's, you know, you you can touch on that... um, I think it was a Carl Sagan joke where it basically said something along the lines of, um, you know, I was at a, um, on my way to the venue this evening, I saw a car with the number plate ZX28 4GE. What are the odds? And it's, if you put it backwards, well, of course, it, it looks extremely unlikely. The, the challenge is to name that number plate before you see it. And I think it's, it's a bit of the same thing here. You know, it's, we have thousands and thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of dinosaur fossils. Let's assume that occasionally these things happen. One of them randomly is going to be an action scene. It just happens to be Velociraptor rather than Velociraptor is special because we, we've got it showing this. Um, but yeah, the truth of the matter is we just don't have that many specimens. There's, I can think of only half a dozen good skeletons that we've got for Velociraptor. They're mostly brilliantly preserved because there's all this lovely, lovely um, windblown sand grains from, from sand dunes and, and stuff. So they look absolutely fantastic. The quality of preservation is absolutely incredible. But there's not that many of them. So they are pretty rare. And then again, the, the, the amount of research that's been done on them is not that much. So they remain this kind of weird enigmatic animal where I think most members of the public would probably tell you something that they know about Velociraptor, which not only have they got from the films and it's probably a fiction, but actually the scientists don't have a very good idea about at all because we just never worked on it that much. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we go back to Pendulette? Because he's got more questions which really sort of drum into this idea of uh, yeah lack of evidence and what we can get from evidence and how many dinosaurs were about. I believe that most of our problems with um, uh, people being religious and people being anti-science is simply and really comes down to this in my mind not being able to imagine big numbers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just reading my friend um, Lawrence Krauss's book uh, about uh, about the history of an atom. And he starts out by saying, you know, we have to imagine the um, entire universe the size of a baseball. (laughs) That's where he's starting. Yeah, I was going to say, he's lost me already (laughs) at that point, pretty much. And you go, Lawrence, we can't do that. And I believe that human beings in their imagination can do about two or three hundred years, maybe five. And when you hear something like Cleopatra live closer to the man on the moon than she did to the building of the pyramids. 
when you realize <laughs> that um, humans have been around 200,000 years, somewhere between 100,000, 200,000 years, and we've had agriculture for 10,000, you, you can't fit that in your mind. I can't. I have no way of doing that. And I believe that evolution is nonsense unless you can think of really big numbers. So with dinosaurs, you've got them gone about 65 million years yeah. ago. Yep. Spot on. And you've got humanoids maybe 6 million years. And you've got dinosaurs for, if I'm not wrong, like 150 million yeah, years. Yeah, um, from about 230 to 65. So now I'm trying to do the math. So 165-ish. So yeah, yeah, right around that. And I know that when we say the word dinosaurs, um, it's like we're saying the word, you know, uh, it's like we're saying the word mammals. There's a huge, broad, different kind. And I also think I know that there was uh, there were many many dying outs and risings oh, yeah. during that yeah, 150 yeah. million years. Absolutely. Yeah. What I wanted to know was what dinosaurs in that 150 million year window were the most successful in terms of being there the longest. Oh boy. Um... I have no I have no sense of how long, you know, the T-Rexes and the yeah. and the others were around and how much because we like what dinosaurs uh, were were um, were walking around together. You know, if we went through a children's book, you know, top twenty most popular dinosaurs, how many of those overlapped? And my other question is, if we were to be at the time of dinosaurs, and we walked out into a field or a forest, how many would we see? Would it be like squirrels or would it be like moose? So. It, which group were the most successful? Um, I, I'm having a quick think. I'd probably have to go for a group called the. Obviously, you could you could pick a really big group, and then that's just been around for absolutely ever. Because if you if you make the group big enough, it's sure. obviously overly encompassing. But in terms of a relatively narrow group, which hang around for a very long time, uh, one called the Ceratosaurs. It's it's not one of those classic top five that you get in every book, but Ceratosaurus. Uh, so it's a big carnivorous dinosaur, um, but it has a horn on the nose is the one thing everyone remembers. And that, that turns up in quite a few things as a result. More like a kind of platy spike. So rather than a rhinoceros-like horn, something that's very flat and it has another pair over the eyes. So that's Ceratosaurus and then obviously Ceratosaurs. Oh yeah, I can picture that guy, yeah. There's a bigger group. So the Ceratosaurs evolved pretty early on. Um, I think they're around in the early Jurassic, so one of the earliest periods. And their descendants at least go right the way to the end. Um, they're clinging on near the end in a couple of southern continents. So they hang around in Madagascar, which was an island even then, and down in South America. Um, but there were, and they, by this time, they their descendants were a group called the, or the specialist division of that, it's called the Abelisaurs, which are famous for having unbelievably tiny arms, even smaller than T-Rexes. They They're like tiny nipples. little flipper They're like ridiculous. paddles. <laughs> yeah, they, they are, they are utterly, utterly, utterly small. So that was the first question you asked. I'm trying to remember the second one. The third one. So you, they you would asked, have, and how, how big are these, um, spiky nosed? Guys. So the so the little ones are tiny. So I was part of a group in China that described one of, if not the smallest, and that guy was two and a half, three meters long with the tail. So only kind of chest high to a human to the top of the head. Um, the big ones were ten meters long. You know, three quarters of a ton, ton in mass. Really serious predators. Um, most of them were pretty big, actually. Uh, but there was a couple of small, small. And it's it's um, it's carnivores that, that that do the longest span, huh? That surprises me. For for that one group, um, yeah. Um, it, well, it's one of those things where there's there's a there's almost a little bit of randomness to it. So of course, to answer the question, who was around longest? You want to be one of the earliest groups and then just not go extinct. <laughs> right. um, and so, you know, there's half a dozen early groups and for whatever reason, they didn't go extinct when the others did and maybe they just got lucky or maybe there was something special about them. Um, but they're, they're not well known. We, we Certainly the early ceratosaurs do not have a great fossil record. Um, so we don't know much about their origins. The one I described or, or helped describe is called Limusaurus, so the mud lizard, because the ones we found were basically died in a in a mud pit, almost like quicksand. Which is um, the way I intend to die, but that's not important. <laughs> um, I'll note that for future. Um, 
but they were actually herbivorous. So there were re- it's a carnivorous branch, but there's a couple of these early divergence, and they were the earliest ones that we know of that flipped back to being herbivores. And they lost yes, all their me teeth. Yes, me too. Me too. Yeah. yeah. Well, d- don't lose your teeth. <laughs> that that would make it harder for you. They got a beak, um, but they, they dropped all their teeth I out. I don't think they had potatoes then either. But, uh... <laughs> Probably. Uh, yeah, n- now I'm trying to think about the You don't have to work of... out the fossil record of potatoes. We're fine. <laughs> the <solar nays. laughs> We've got too many questions. Um, Come on. <laughs> yes. Um, the third one was, if yeah, if you walked out of a time machine, how many would you see? Probably quite a few. Um, it's going to depend on where you go. You know, if you if you go to grasslands, even, you know, back three 300 years before, you know, the buffalo had really taken a hammering, you know, buffalo were present in large numbers, but there's still going to be areas where they're less common. Whereas obviously there are bits like the Maasai Mara Serengeti, even now in Africa, where... Yeah, it's just big animals, you know, every few hundred yards. It's really not, you know, yeah, you might go half an hour without seeing anything, but the odds are if you dropped into a random spot, you would probably see an elephant or a rhino or a giraffe or a dozen zebra or maybe a few hundred wildebeest. Um, And there's no reason to think that the dinosaurs were any less numerous. In fact, there's some reason to think they were quite a lot more numerous because in some ways some of the big ones were actually really efficient and therefore you can have more biomass of dinosaur than you could of mammal for the same amount of plant, which might actually make them quite a bit more numerous in some places. Uh, so potentially, yeah, you could walk out and easily see them. Uh, and, and what is the nearest thing, if you were not allowed to speak, but could only point to an animal, what is the thing alive today that's closest to a dinosaur? Would it be alligator or would it be pigeon? <laughs> Um, ev- sort sort of pigeon, but not really, and equally sort of not alligator. So, so, so birds are the literal descendants of dinosaurs. Um, so birds are dinosaurs. So that that's one. There is an idea that chickens are in some ways the closest to dinosaurs, and they're not. For birds that are still alive today, because obviously lots of bird species are extinct as well, you've basically got three big branches of bird evolution. One is things like ostriches, one is chickens and ducks and geese and turkeys and pheasants, and one is everything else. And so, of course, because of the way they branch out, you could argue that any of those three big branches is the nearest thing. But effectively, something that's close to the ancestor of ostriches and chickens. But of course, that bird doesn't exist anymore. That was around probably 70 million years ago. (laughs) We also f***ed up chickens so much. Chickens are not anything that ever... Cows and chickens, we kind of created. I I mean, I think the Indian jungle fowl in its true wide, wild form is still pretty close to being a natural animal um it might be it might be a feral domesticated version but there there are enough chicken species that live in environments like that which look pretty close when i um, was uh when i was in junior high i asked a question that had it been answered had I had it been answered differently, I believe I would have gone into uh, into some form of the sciences as opposed to being a juggler. And that was I asked about wild cows. I said, "What are wild cows? What did we start with on our domestication of animals?" And the teacher laughed at me and said, "What do you mean? They're just cows." Yeah. Oh. Had that been answered, boy, that's an interesting question, Pen. Maybe you can spend the rest of your life asking it then you would now be interviewing me as Penn, the cow expert, the person who knows more about wild cows than any other person on the planet. The biggest yeah. ranch. Yeah, and, and that, it, that is a great... But it, now it, you're talking to someone who knows nothing. <laughs> I think we not both know that's not true. true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All my fascination with dinosaurs is strictly in time. Mm. Just yeah. trying to get that... Six million, hundred and sixty-five million. Yeah, it's to balance not- together. Because if you can hold, I believe, if you train yourself, and I believe it takes decades, if you train yourself to be able to think in millions, I believe you can understand evolution. Yeah, it's, and it's if something- you can't, you're taking it on faith. Yeah, my, my my dad bugs me about this. He goes, "How how do you deal with the numbers?" And and I I'm not sure I do. They they've kind of become abstract to me because, yeah, as you as you say, even though I work on it, yeah, 148 million years versus 152 million years, they're both almost equally inconceivable. As is a four million year difference between them. It's- and yes, huge huge difference. Yeah. And yet you just shrug it off. Yeah. 
I think I think we worked out at the, our very first episode. We tried to explain it. We said, well, if you take all the Harry Potter books, so that's seven volumes, yeah. and how big they are. There's about just over a million words in all of them. So if each word is a year, then you have to imagine a shelves of Harry Potter books back in time with each entire, even the word A or Dumbledore is all one year. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a, you can't yeah. deal with that amount of time. There's an interesting thing about the evolution thing. If you, uh, I recently read Tom Holland's book, Dominion, and that poses, it, it sort of shifts your the reason why Christianity finds evolution so hard to grasp, it is that the idea of survival of the fittest, and that is directly against the Christian idea of the meek will inherit the earth. And it's that mm. that really riles them up and makes them fight against it because they want to see God in nature. And yeah. but, it's, <laughs> but it's also because, and I argue with all my friends on this, my friend, uh, uh, Dr. Greger, who's an epidemiologist, I was just reading his book, and the verbs he chooses to use are wants, you know, yeah. the virus wants this. Yeah. And um, my help. biologist friends use those terms. And that um, anthropomorphizing, I believe, drives people crazy yeah. because yeah. evolution, uh, the, corona, the coronavirus yeah. does not want or need anything. No. It's just the one that happens to live is not even trying to live. Yeah. It's just that we know about it because it does live. And that sentence is the hardest thing for me to understand. The coronavirus is not mutating. It doesn't, you know, if it doesn't kill people, it's more successful. If it's longer being contagious before showing symptoms, it's more successful. Yeah. None of that has any plan or any idea. All of that is just, oh, well, that's what happens. And that thing you said was very, very important that uh, I think is often forgotten when talking about evolution in that the one that just happens to live. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I have no sense of how much of that is chance. I can't do that on Microsoft and Apple <laughs> and, you know, why Bill Gates was so successful. If yeah. you talk to him, he will tell you Almost any successful, truly successful person will tell you there's a huge difference with luck because Bill Gates knows personally and socializes with three dozen people who are smarter, harder working, mm -hmm. and uh, less successful. He knows, and he knows they're smarter in every way he's smart, and he knows they work harder, but he knows they're less successful. So he's flooded with that information to know that he's lucky. But that's the easy one because we understand people. Yeah. The idea of understanding that a dinosaur at the, er the early part of the dinosaur reign makes it through 160 million years because of luck. Once we've learned survival of the fittest, then we've got to go back and go, and oh, by the way, that's not true. They can also get lucky. <laughs> Shut up. I was just working on that because the, the fittest always survive we can kind of get our heads around. Yeah. But the idea that you've got to be successful and buy the lottery ticket that wins, both of those things simultaneously, and you have 100 million years to do it. Yeah. And but you but, get to buy a ticket every day. But it also goes back to your point about big numbers because the populations are often inconceivable. Mm -hmm. that, that's the other thing, you know, all right, you know, there's a million wildebeest, there's a million buffalo, even those are giant numbers. But yeah, when you're when you're talking about beetles or bacteria, which are in the trillions, then yeah, it's not too hard for one of them to win the lottery every day of the week. Because I'm reading the <laughs> Lawrence Krauss book, and he has 10 to the 27th power. <laughs> That's a number he's sure. throwing at me. Yeah. And I write him an email and I go, Lawrence, don't you realize that some people who dropped out of Greenfield Public High School are going to be reading this? <laughs> Try to keep your numbers under 100. Yeah. <laughs> well, he could have 100 to the 26th. <laughs> well, it's like most people when they hear about a billionaire and they think, oh, millionaires and billionaires, forgetting that. A, a thousand, you know, what's you know. the difference between a millionaire and a billionaire? About a billion dollars. The uh, there was a horrible study that was done in the um, uh, done with American school teachers mm. who thought that million and billion were both just big numbers. Mm. Oh. 
<laughs> and, you know, you've got to say, you know, there was this wonderful chart. I, I can't do it off the top of my head. But one in 10 happens to you today. Yeah. One in 100 happens to you this week. One in 1,000 happens to you in a year. One in 10,000 happens to someone you know. Yeah. One in 100,000 happens to someone you've heard about. And one in a million you never know about unless there's electronic media. Yeah. We haven't even gotten over one in a million, yeah. you know. And, and there's the other problem, which I think can, can sum up our political problems, which is we are kind of set to deal with about 300 people in our lives. Yeah. So that when we see someone pulling off someone's mask and hitting them with a club, part of our lizard brain thinks that's about one in 300 people are doing that. Yeah. It's we one see in someone. 150 is a Dunbar's number. 150. What's it? What's Dunbar's it? number is 150. Right. So that's that's a lovely that's a lovely little study he did. So what he did is he hollowed out a load of um, primates' brains and worked out their brain volumes, and then worked out the social group size they were in. So he went from like you know little gibbons, macaques, and that right. sort of thing, up to chimps, and then he just worked out, extrapolated from a human's brain volume the amount the bigger the size of the tribe, and it is about 150. Give or yeah. take, depending on. And so that, your tribe, your tribe is 150, and you know about 300. Yeah, but you won't be able to relate to more than 150. Right. That's the idea. Right. So, which does also mean, though, if you work at it backwards, that the reason we have this big brain is to cope with a tribe that large, which mm -hmm. is quite lovely if you think about it. All of this communication and intelligence that we have isn't so that we can go off and do amazing things and survive. It is actually so we can chat to everybody to keep our group together. That's why we need language. That's why we need to be able to put one thought in front of the other so we can keep this group of people we have together because we can't groom everybody because if we groomed everybody it would take 12 hours a day and we'd just die of starvation i've been trying to have yeah. you well well done groom everybody yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do that's, it very effectively so that's what, been what the goal you <laughs> but I, you know that's uh, when i try to uh when when i you know I, i'm living in the united states now mm. so the um uh whatever outrage you and your friends are feeling um mine is by a factor of two probably yeah. And um, uh, it is incredible to try to remember that the outrage we're feeling is, is outsized. When you see the people in the Ozarks without masks um, yeah. at a swimming pool, yeah. trying to remember that that being 100 people is not a number in a population of 350 million. That's not a number. Yeah. That's not a number at all. It's not a percentage. It's nothing you can even think of. So these people doing stupid things that build the outrage is still this tiny, tiny, tiny number. The same as, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter protests. Yeah, people were looting and breaking into targets and lighting fires. And the number of people that were doing that are the number of people that can speak Mandarin, Arabic, and English fluently without an accent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably not those individuals, though. No. <laughs> so when I think about uh, dinosaurs, it's just more of um, me trying desperately to expand um, my ability to see numbers. You're working on the difference between 165 million and 170 million. I'm working on 150 to 151. That's what I'm, <laughs> that's what I'm pushing. So a massive thank you there. That's Pendulette. That that made our that made, that was a very good August, I think, <laughs> getting that interview. So yeah. thank you very much to Pen. Do also he's got a podcast um as well called Pendulette Sunday School. Um and yeah, do obviously support him in all ways, as you can support us in all ways, because not only are we on Patreon, thank you to all our patrons. They've been getting a couple of bonus episodes during the breaks between um series, but also um we're we're just launching some um merch that people people can get so if you like merch um do go on to our website terrible lizards and you can find links to that and if you like and eyes as well you can have merch and eyes <laughs> oh god <laughs> i don't know if you're allowed to make dad jokes i think <laughs> i was going to say and people are like she's the professional comedian i'm obviously not the professional paleontologist that's the <laughs> <laughs> I know people who will write mm. in and suggest otherwise. <laughs> mm. Anyway, so um, <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you very much for this week, um, and until next week, we will say. Then <laughs> you see, you could, you could more of it. I want a bigger. We could be like a. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
There you go. That's a very angry velociraptor. Go very quickly past. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> that was quite good, actually. I was quite pleased with that one. Doppler effect uh, for the physicist in the room. Thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast. For bonus episodes and extra content, please visit our Patreon page. You can also purchase a mug, T-shirt or a Terrible Lizard face mask from Redbubble. Go to terriblelizards.co.uk for links. Send us your questions. Email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook and Twitter. Include the hashtag terriblelizards. We hope to bring you more and more, but we can only do that if we get enough listeners. So please like, share, leave a review and subscribe. 